Hi, I'm Top Orlando Realtor Scott Garrison with my partner Deanna Sakoto, and we're here with Lance Raglan, who's an attorney specializes in estates, probates, trusts here in Winter Springs. Look him up on Google and you'll see he's one of the top rated attorneys here in the area if you're looking for an estate, probate, or trust. So in addition to being an awesome attorney, which is what you want, Lance is very active in the community as well. He's a co-founder and he currently serves as a member of the board of directors of the Help Kids Play Sports, a nonprofit organization that's dedicated to providing funding for disadvantaged children to participate in local sports leagues here in East Orlando. He's also a member of the Oviedo Rotary Club, which we love, and he serves as uh, the committee chair for the service projects. So he's active in the community. He's active here in his office every day, helping you with your wills, estates, and trusts. So Lance, tell us a little bit about um, what, what is it, how would you describe what it is that you do? So um, for the most part, uh, we try to help people make sure that when they have uh, left this earth that their assets are going to be distributed uh, in a way that they uh, desire to have them distributed to the people that they want them to go to. Uh, and it, uh, most of what we do allows them to direct who's going to be in charge of making sure that that happens in the way that they've directed in their documents. So we do wills and we do trusts uh, and other documents that help with that sort of thing as well uh, so that uh, the wishes can be carried out in the way that, that they want them to. So um, most of the people think that having a will is enough to protect their assets and, and to do their wishes. Yeah, so um, the will does uh, allow you to direct who would be in charge of uh, making the distributions that you can also direct in your will. So in your will, uh, you are able to direct to whom these assets are to go and how you want them to be distributed. And you can also choose uh, the person that you are uh, most comfortable with handling those distributions for you once you are gone. So do you think that wheels Oh, oh, I will ask the question, are wills uh, the best way to do this? They're not the best way. They are a tool that we use. Um, we like to use revocable living trusts quite a bit. Uh, uh, the purpose for the trusts that um, sort of some of the advantages that you get with the trust that you don't necessarily get with a will is that a trust can help you avoid the probate process. Uh, which I assume we'll, we'll talk about, but um, it, uh, the, the will kit, excuse me, the trust can help avoid that probate process. It can also pro provide some other advantages such as asset protection for the beneficiaries that you're leaving the assets to, depending on the circumstances. Uh, it also allows you to provide for what is going to happen to these assets if the initial beneficiaries that you've appointed or, or uh, nominated aren't alive at the time that you pass away. And so um, we can get very complicated as necessary through the trust to make sure that no matter what the circumstances are at the time that you pass away, that you've got things set up the way that you want them to be and you're in control of that and in charge of that. Uh, versus not having a plan at all, uh, in which case uh, the, the probate process will, will actually direct where your assets are going to be distributed, which might not be the way you want them to be distributed, and uh, it will also uh, help determine who is going to be in charge of making those distributions, which also might not be who you want to be in charge of them. So uh, it's important to at least have a will. Um, uh, if you can, or actually the trust uh, is a better option, it provides more benefits, but sometimes a will can be enough. It just depends on the circumstances. Yeah, if all the circumstances are perfect, the will is enough. Correct. But, you know, life is not perfect. That is exactly right. <laughs> and, um, you know, all, every family is not the same, and, you know, blended families and things like that, uh, they bring about certain aspects that Florida law may not provide for in determining where the assets are going to go um, uh, if you don't have a will 
at least a will or a trust that's going to direct all of that for you. So, yeah. um, you've been an attorney for quite a while. Everyone loves an origin story. How yeah. did you end up here in your great office? How did you get into this? So um, I had a mentor when I was really young, actually. Uh, a, a family friend uh, kind of took an interest in me and uh, offered to sort of assist me. He was a lawyer. A uh, local lawyer here in town actually became a local judge here in town. And um, as a young person, I mean, even as young as 13, 14 years old, he kind of, uh, you know, offered his assistance and direction to me. And um, I really thought he was a neat guy and respected him a lot and in a lot of ways wanted to be like him. And it just, you know, once he expressed that interest in me, uh, it just took off from there. Oh, and uh, I, I really didn't veer from the path all that much since I was 14, 13, 14, 15 years old. Oh, what an impact we could have on young people Unbelievable. just with a small amount. Unbelievable. So yep. from the time you were 13, 14, from the time you were yep. a little boy, yep. you said, I kind of want to do this. I kind of want to do and this. And here it is. We're kind of on the opposite, you and I being a little boy, and, <laughs> and you're still doing it, right? Yep. Absolutely. So how did you go from that inspiration, just kind of roughly just take us through like the inspiration to become an attorney, yeah. and how did you end up here? You're a sole proprietor, a sole in your practice. Correct. Right? Yep. Okay, good. Yep. So um, when... I decided that the law was going to be my thing. I really thought that I was going to be a litigator of some sort. I'd be in the courtroom every day. And then I got to law school and realized pretty quickly that that wasn't what I was interested in doing. So um, I, I was a little nervous at that point because I wasn't sure what the options were. But then I kind of stumbled upon uh, the wills, trusts, and estates uh, practice area and then just kind of followed through with that. and. Um, I got out of school and um, worked for a couple of different law firms doing estate planning stuff and um, eventually opened up my own office in Altamont and uh, brought on a partner and that lasted for a couple of years and I got a really good offer from a really good law firm uh, in town that I really couldn't pass up so I closed that law firm down and I thought I'd work with that law firm for a few years and kind of learn what they know and go out on my own. Well, 12 years later, I was still sitting there and thinking, uh, maybe, you, or you, you kind of need to make a decision. Are we going to stay at this law firm or are we going to do what we thought we were going to do at, uh, you know, when we started here 12 years ago? And so I just decided to move out on my own. Uh, it's been about 10 years now that I've been, about, been out on my own. And um, I had an office over in Oviedo for a few years, and we uh, moved over here about three years ago, and um, it's been great. So when you're looking for an attorney, it's important to get someone who has the passion to do this. And obviously, he has the passion to do this since he's been a little boy. This <laughs> has been the only thing you've known, right? Really? Yeah. And you know that you've got the right attorney when you're not dealing with some big, impersonal, corporate monolith. And that's probably, I'm guessing, the reason why you wanted to go out on your own. Absolutely. Absolutely. The, the firm that I worked for was an absolutely wonderful firm. Uh, the education that I got there uh, was just uh, priceless, invaluable. Um, but I really wanted to take that, what I learned there, and sort of do my own thing, right? And be my own boss. And um, it's just, it's worked out great. So if you look online at Lance's reviews, you're going to find the same thing. Many people, most people, don't want to deal with some huge office building with 16 layers of receptionists and people <laughs> between you and the attorney. You want to get an attorney who's going to sit down with you at a table just like this, look at you, and help you, and that's what you do. It's one guy, Absolutely. one receptionist, one office, tremendous amount of business, but it's the personal touch that's going to make the difference in most things, including making sure that your will, your trust, the probate, it all gets done right. That is correct. And when you're looking for someone also here in East Orlando, it's important to get someone with ties in the community. It's the difference between going to a local coffee shop and shopping at Starbucks, which is definitely not part of the local community. <laughs> and you've been part of the community.
community for a long time. What high school did you go to? Long, long time. I went to Lake Hell High School, which is just down the street, like maybe a, a mile away. and a half yeah. from here, maybe. Um, I actually went to Tuscaloosa Middle School, and in fifth grade, I went to Sterling Park Elementary. Oh so my gosh. Since fifth grade, I've kind of been living in this community other than going to college and going to local school. Well, even in college, you went to Gainesville for a while, but you also went locally here, correct? At UCF, yep, absolutely. Uh, kind of back and forth a little bit between Good. UCF and Gainesville, and then uh, uh, law school at Stetson in St. Petersburg, and I worked in uh, Tampa, St. Pete area for maybe two years after I graduated, and then realized it was time to get back home, and so I've been here ever since. For sure. So even when you went to law school, mm -hmm. if you were to Google the closest law school to East Orlando, that's probably where you went, right? It's, it's uh, yeah, it is probably one of them. Uh, I think when I started there, Barry Law School was not accredited, mm -hmm. and so it wasn't really an option that I was considering at the time, although obviously it has been accredited since, and now there's FAMU and uh, certain other law schools that may be a little bit closer, but well, Stetson may have been the closest at the time. Stetson is like 30 minutes, 40 minutes away right in Delane, right? Well, so even that's local. Actually, the law school is in St. Petersburg, okay. so it's still a couple hours away, but you know, there's just, well, there's not a lot of law schools in between here and there, at least. 27 years ago whenever I was going to law school so so not only did you go to elementary school to middle school to high school mm -hmm. to college went pretty close here in law school you spent your whole life here in the community as well and you're part of the Rotary Club tell us a little bit about what you do for that oh the Rotary Club it, that Rotary Club <laughs> is uh, just it's an absolutely wonderful organization that I've been a part of ever since I moved my office from Winter Park, or I left the old office in Winter Park and opened up my office at Oviedo. Um, you know, it's just like everything else. You know, you, you join these organizations hoping that it may be uh, good for your business and networking and things like that. But very quickly with the Rotary Club, you realize that you're in this club with a bunch of wonderful people who care about the community and it can't help but rub off on you and the main focus now is just to be involved in that community um, i am the uh, chairman on the of the uh, service projects committee uh, for the rotary club which is a big uh, sort of aspect of what we do which is to kind of go around uh, identify needs in the community and um, help people with uh, certain things. Uh, it may be a yard cleanup for somebody who can't get out and do it on their own. We've painted houses before. We've cleaned up the inside of houses. We just helped a lady uh, box up a bunch of stuff for a move that she was embarking on and didn't have any uh, help for. So we do we do a lot of stuff. You deliver wheel, meals, meals on wheels. wheels meals, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. So how many attorneys you know are out in the middle of the afternoon <laughs> delivering <laughs> Meals on Meals okay. to local Eating people? Houses. Yeah. So, so the purpose of the Rotary is to give back on the, the local community level, back to the community. It's pretty fair to say there's almost zero attorneys around that are interested in the community and willing to give back to take that time and still run a successful business. Absolutely. And that's what the Rotary is, so good job doing it. To be fair, we do have a couple of other lawyers in oh, the yeah, club. Yeah, we do. Um, you know, but uh, yeah, you have to have a desire to to help because uh, if you're not there to help, you're probably not going to be there for very long. So when you're thinking about hiring an attorney, you say, who should we call? You want to get someone who's good. You want to get someone who has great reviews. You want to get someone who's accessible like this so you can kind of see before you get a chance to come in and meet. It's also important to get someone who's involved in the local community and having gone to elementary school here within a couple of minutes of your office is about as local as you get. How long have you been practicing law? Uh, I took the bar exam and was admitted to the bar 27 years ago. So that's some serious experience. You were not <laughs> figuring out how to do this. That's right. Good. That's right. What would you say that you're best at professionally? What is, like, what's your thing that you say, this is the thing that I can do? Well, uh, I, I really enjoy meeting with people. And, and my philosophy of doing this, and I've encountered lots of different philosophies uh, throughout my career, but my philosophy in doing this is explaining uh, 
all of the options, the issues that may come up with all of the options, um, and really trying to give an education uh, to my, my clients, my potential clients, uh, in a way that they can understand what it is that we're talking about, right? And then allowing them to make an educated decision based on what we've talked about as to what the best plan is for them. Now, obviously, I'm going to make a recommendation in most cases. Um, but in the end, I want the client to kind of understand what the issues are. And I want that client to be comfortable with what it is they're going to end up doing with me, if, if anything at all. Who would you say your typical client is? Who are the people who should be thinking about hiring? It's just about everybody, but sort of the, uh, uh, the, the, the bread and butter of my practice are just normal, regular families. Um, it's interesting that we, we've got a lot of younger folks these days that are concerned about these issues for their children. Uh, and, and it's not just the elderly that come in every day, but it, you know, it, it, it just, there's just a huge, right, uh, a huge range of folks that come in um, that, that are interested in at least talking about this type of planning these days. And it's great that that kind of information is out there, especially for young people who have children and, 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 and historically may have, not, have never considered uh, what needs to be done when you have a child uh, and you're starting to accumulate some assets and things like that. So it really is a pretty large range of not, people. But it's not just the assets, because when I just have my child, that he's 17 mm -hmm. now, and someone told me, it's like, uh, do you have a will? I say, no, because, you know, we just have a, a home. Uh -huh. you know, we don't have much. Yeah. So it's, if something happens, it's going to go automatically to the child. Yeah. And if they say no, because the child becomes part of the state. Yeah, sure. So the state is the one that is going to decide who is going to the child stay with, be, live with. And in our case, that we didn't have any family. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're like, so. Yeah, and, and especially, you know, when you're talking about younger couples with younger children, and by younger, that can be, you know, okay. even 25 or, or, or 30, to be honest with you. Um, you may not want your children at a particular age to be the beneficiary of your assets and receive all those assets at a particular age uh, when maybe they're not really equipped to, um, you know, make good decisions with those assets. And so a good estate plan will allow you to... Um, maybe put somebody else in charge of managing these assets for the benefit of these children until they reach an age where you might be a little bit more comfortable with them having control and access and things like that. And, and literally, if they're under the age of 18, uh, you may end up, or you, after you're gone, your children may end up in a guardianship situation where the court has to get involved in appointing somebody that you may not want to be in charge of managing those assets for the benefit of your kids. And it's costly and it's time consuming and it's something that you'd want to avoid. And a good estate plan is going to do that for people. And it's important that the younger folks understand that those are issues uh, that can come up uh, so it's not just for the elderly, that's, that's for sure. And then one extra thing, so, um, so as most of you know, I have a special nature. Mm -hmm. And Lance helped me with special need trust, because that's super important if you have a special need child or person around you. It's, you know, it's a key, he explained me everything, and I did that, and yeah. um, I feel in very peace. Yes, it's uh, yeah. I mean, those that those are obviously some special circumstances that you know uh, may precipitate you wanting to come in and at least discuss those things. And we've got some tools that we can use uh, to make sure that those things are being taken care of in the way that you want them to, without um, eliminating the child's ability to receive what other 
whatever other government benefits that they might be entitled to receive, and also making sure that you've chosen the person that you would want to be in charge of managing those assets for his or her benefit uh, in those types of situations. So it's not just young people, uh, it can be special needs people, there's just all kinds of folks that um, may need uh, that kind of guidance at least for a period of time in their lives, and a good estate plan can, can provide for that. Mm -hmm. I have another question. So I have people that they say they, they have a lady bird deed. So what's your opinion about that? So a, a lady bird deed uh, can be a useful tool in the estate planning process, and a lot of lawyers really believe in them. Can you um, say what a ladybird deed is? For yeah, ab that absolutely. Word? A ladybird deed is uh, a deed where you can actually, in essence, name a beneficiary on the deed to receive the property whenever you pass away. Um, and it's automatic and it avoids the probate process. So the idea of it is a really good idea. Um, in most cases, it's something that you would use if you don't have a trust, right? So you might put a will together, uh, and then if you've got a homestead property or, or other properties, as a matter of fact, you can transfer those properties to your beneficiaries without probate. And the idea with the Ladybird deed is, uh, it's also referred to as an enhanced life estate deed, which means the enhanced part means that uh, not only do you have this life estate in the deed, which means you have the right to live there for the rest of your life and you haven't really given the property away until you pass away, the enhanced portion of it means that, uh, and there's language specifically included in the Lady Bird deed that says that you have the power basically to do whatever you want to do with that house during your lifetime. You can uh, change it so that and different sell. beneficiaries are going to uh, receive it. You can sell the property, you can remortgage the property, anything really that you want to do. Um, there are a couple of potential pitfalls uh, that I do know that some people have experienced, uh, one of which is um, that the title companies sometimes aren't necessarily familiar with these things, although I think that's getting less and less true as we move forward, but um, sometimes, despite the language in the deed that says that you can do whatever you want with these assets, or with that property, um, without the consent of the people that you're leaving it to, sometimes when you go to sell it, the title company is gonna want those people to consent anyway, and if it's a situation where a child that you're leaving it to doesn't want you to sell the house, it's possible that they could block the sale uh, of your house. And so uh, when people hear that, a lot of times um, they sort of back away from the ladybird deed because they want to be in control of what's going on and they don't want their children or anybody else to be able to tell them what they can do and what they can't do with the property. Uh, another potential issue is that sometimes, and, and this is particularly true with tax liens, but if the person or beneficiary that you're leaving this property to, whether it's a child or a grandchild or a friend or whomever, um, if they end up with creditor issues, it's possible that a lien can be put on the property because their name is uh, on the deed. Uh, and whether that's right or wrong, uh, you may have to spend some money to defend the fact that, you know, that's not the case. And if you try to sell your property and they want you to pay off the lien, it may cost you much. First of all, you may end up having to pay the lien, if it's a tax lien, certainly. Um, and if it's a, some other type of lien, you may have to spend money to get that removed and get the consent of those creditors to move forward with the sale, which makes things pretty difficult in a time when you just want things to go smoothly with the sale of your house. And so it, it can present some challenges, but in the right circumstances, it's a great tool that can be used. It's a, um, uh, but it's just that, it's a tool. It's not a comprehensive solution to an estate plan uh, like a trust would be. And I think I said before, if you have a trust plan, you probably wouldn't do a ladybird deed. Instead, you would actually transfer the, the real estate to your trust, and then the trust would have all of those provisions that would 
uh, govern what would happen, for instance, if your beneficiary passed away. Right? You could be in the same situation where, uh, you know, we talked about before with like beneficiary designations and things like that. If you leave your house through a ladybird deed to a person who, God forbid, passes away in a car accident with you, now what happens to that property? It's going to end up going through probate, probably. Um, and it may end up going, let's say, to the child of the child that passed away in the car accident with you and that child may be 10 years old and now you've got a guardianship. So now you've done a probate and a guardianship which would have been completely taken care of if you had a trust plan. The great thing about a ladybird deed if the circumstances are right is that it's much less expensive than doing a trust plan. Oh, and that's another question yeah. because uh, because some clients they say that I don't have the money to do this. Sure, absolutely. So, like, and and there are there are lots of ways to um, avoid probate, right? If the circumstances are right, without having to do a trust plan. Um, in my opinion, the trust plan is the one plan that solves all the problems without creating I, additional potential problems. Better, I mean, be, better than a better will. Better than a will, uh, better than using beneficiary designations at the bank or um, you know your other financial institutions on your accounts and things like that. Go ahead. I mean, the long run, it will be very unexpensive compared to a probate or... Uh, a, a, absolutely. If, uh, if you do a will and uh, you know you make a mistake and something doesn't get a beneficiary designation on it or God forbid your beneficiary has passed away and you, end up, you could very well end up going through a probate process which in most cases is going to cost you a lot more than what you paid to do the trust in the first place. And then the trust is going to be that complete package uh, that includes the trust it includes a will that works with that trust. It includes a power of attorney, a health care surrogate, a living will, all those other documents that sort of make up a complete plan uh, for an individual. And those other documents that I mentioned are super important, obviously, during the lifetime of the individual who's creating the plan and then and the trust as well at that time. But the will and the trust would the will would take effect on the death of that individual and the trust would just continue on after the death of that individual. Uh, in most cases, we would put the real estate in the trust. We can use beneficiary designations on the accounts to name the trust as a beneficiary on the financial stuff so that when the individual passes away, those assets end up in the trust with no probate, which means they can be distributed to the beneficiaries with no probate. And if you've got a situation where your first line of beneficiary, you've lost somebody there, somebody's passed away, you will be able to control exactly what happens to the assets of that de deceased individual, a child for instance, when those assets may be passed down to the children of this child that have passed away and there won't be a guardianship and there won't be a probate as long as the provisions have been included to, to provide for all of that. And how long a probate can take? So a probate, uh, the, the, the downsides to the probate um, are that they can be very time consuming. As we discussed, they can be extremely expensive and they can take quite a little while to get done. Um, a standard probate uh, without any hiccups or uh, issues, probably in the neighborhood of six months to a year to get it taken care of. And a lot of that depends on uh, you know, how busy the lawyer is, how busy the judges are, how busy the clerks are. So it largely depends on the county that you're filing that probate in. Uh, but we definitely uh, tell people that you can expect it to be six months to a year. And, and with you, real estate, one yeah. of the things people don't think about is when it goes through probate and you've got one or multiple properties, during that time, no one owns the property legally. Technically. Someone has to pay the mortgage, the taxes, the upkeep. And so there's a 
six to 12 month period where someone is responsible for the house, otherwise bad things happen, and yet they don't know that the probate's actually gonna even go through to their name. And that's one of the biggest upsets we see as realtors, yeah. is someone says, okay, you know, someone has passed on, unfortunately, and I'm like, well, I just gotta maintain the house at your cost for the next 12 months, and hopefully maybe right. sort of it'll work out. And yeah, that's a, that's a big issue, as well, if they had a trust, it would be much less time. Much less time, um, yes, and what you're speaking about specifically is homestead property, which is uh, your primary residence, uh, and that is treated a little bit differently than, say, a rental property or a vacation home, but you're 100% correct. There are all kinds of uh, waiting periods and um, deadlines and all of that sort of stuff, but oftentimes it's a hurry up and wait situation, and you're looking at about six months at least before you can sell that homestead property unless you want to go about uh, filing a special petition with the court for permission to sell it before what we call the claims period has run and you've gotten the homestead order on the uh, on the property so yeah it can it can take some time and in my or, experience six months is yeah 12 months <laughs> yeah, right. No, uh, and, then I, yes. and then we just, I know uh, someone that she just, she just finished and it was 10 years. Oh, well, then, or 10 years, I guess. <laughs> Sometimes right. problems can arise. Okay. There's no doubt yeah. about it. Yeah. And, and probate can take a long time if that is the because case. Because they don't agree. They, exactly. They, they, you know. Yep, if there's conflict, uh, there's just no predicting how long it can take to get through the process. I'd like to ask, um, I'm gonna, we may edit this out. I wanna ask a couple of more general questions before we run out of time here. So, um, so I'd like to ask a couple of questions that people are thinking when they're thinking about hiring you. Sure. And one of them is gonna be, so how much is this, this sounds expensive. How much is this gonna cost? <laughs> so, so for your average client, mm -hmm. about approximate, either they can get a will with you, or yes. they can go with the trust package, which has got a will, a power attorney, a living power attorney. So just give us an idea of about like how much should they be willing to spend roughly? Yeah, we, we do have some standard uh, fees that we try to stick to. Every situation is different, obviously. And it depends if you're a single person or a married couple or, um, you know, just whatever your situation. And it certainly depends on whether you're a blended family that can be a little more expensive, but uh, a standard will package for an individual, which would include the will, the power of attorney, the healthcare surrogate, and the living will, you're probably looking at in the neighborhood of $800 for the will and all those other documents. Now, when you're talking about a trust, well, first with the will, yeah, it's about $800, uh -huh. but if it's not standard and it's a little more complicated, what's kind of the most it could go within uh, reason? Well, like, the, the, the way we do these packages, because mm -hmm. as you start adding on the different things that mm -hmm. may need to be added to the will, if it's not a standard mm -hmm. situation, um, we sort of try to move to the trust mm -hmm. if it's not so basic of a situation. So um, there are uh, things that we can add to the will, but as you add those things, they get more and more expensive. And then in the end, if you just pay a little bit more, you're also going to avoid the probate process if you do the trust. So, so somebody's watching this and they're thinking, yeah. all right, so not a will. How much is this whole trust thing roughly going to run it? You're looking at more like $2,500 to $3,500 these days to get the trust done, uh, which again is the trust, uh, a will that works with the trust mm -hmm. that we hope we don't have to use, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it's kind of a safety net that we put in there to make sure everything gets in the trust, but the idea is to have everything in the trust beforehand. But So it comes with that will, uh, again, the power of attorney, the healthcare surrogate, and the living will, and uh, you're looking at, like I said, uh, probably in the neighborhood of $2,500 to $3,500 for that type of package. Um, and then it's gonna avoid the probate process, which... So uh, I went to a, a class once and told me many times, and he said, you know, when the caca hits the fan, <laughs> he says, it's a very thin stack of papers. He held it up. It makes a difference between you losing everything and it doing exactly the way you want. And I found that personally several times in my life. Um, I have a lot of clients who've gone through this. Most of them don't have the papers, and it costs them tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah, because of probate. How much a probate? So, um, 
That's uh, so different lawyers do it differently, right? And so, uh, but you could be paying, you know, four hundred, four hundred and fifty dollars an hour to go through this process, right? If if a lawyer charges hourly, we try not to charge hourly, um, and there are some promulgated, uh, presumed reasonable rates uh, that are set forth in the Florida statutes, and um, generally speaking. Uh, they can range from uh, 3% uh, for an estate that's under a million dollars, right? So 3% of a million dollar estate would be like $30,000. So it can be very, very expensive. As, you, as the value of the estate gets higher, the, the estate uh, gets higher, the uh, percentages go lower, right? Mm -hmm. So you might be at 3% for the first part of it, then 2.5% for another portion of it. But that can get very, very expensive. Now, uh, a lawyer also has the ability to reduce those percentages or to just simply qu quote a flat fee, which is what I prefer to do, either use those rates, quote a flat fee that I think is reasonable based on the circumstances, and give the client the opportunity to, to say yes or no. But it could easily be $10,000. Oh, very easily. easily. Very so easily. if you're watching this and you're thinking, should I even mess with this? Well, you can do nothing and you'll end up, your hair, people who you want to leave your, the things that you've worked for for your whole life to, will have nothing or very less. Or you can spend eight hundred, fifteen hundred dollars, okay. or you can spend three thousand, three thousand, thirty-five hundred dollars, or you can take the burden of all of this and to the people, your children, or the people you're trying to leave the money to, leave them a bill which has to be paid for at least ten thousand dollars, and that's just the legal fees. That's not counting maintaining yes. your properties for the next twelve months mm -hmm. before you do that. Do so you can see by planning in advance. Not only are you, things going to go the way you want, but you're going to save the people who you want to have your assets tens and tens of thousands of dollars and years of frustration. All for sitting down with him for an hour or two, mm -hmm. writing a little check. Mm -hmm. Which everyone needs to do anyway, right? You said pretty much everyone needs to do this. It really needs to be done, uh, especially if you have children. But ultimately, if you care where your assets go, and you care who you want to be in charge of them, uh, making those distributions, and you care about the cost of getting that done, you need an estate plan. So you've worked your whole life to accumulate things, to save things, to get a property, to have assets, to have people in your life that you care about, that you want to have that when unfortunately it is time for you to go. Your whole life, years and years and years, and how long will it take for them to set up a trust and write a check for $3,500? How long is that whole process? Yeah, so we generally do it in just a couple of meetings. We'll sit down, like I said, we'll go over everything, we'll go over all of the options that anybody wants to talk about, I'll give the prices right then and there, and then the idea is let them, let the client make an educated decision as to what they want to go forward with, if anything, and it's a free initial consultation, if the answer is, we're going to go elsewhere or whatever the situation is, that's 100% fine. But the first appointment is usually about an hour and a half. During that appointment, if they decide to move forward, if the client decides to move forward, uh, I will get all of the information that I need to draft the documents. Uh, it'll take me a few weeks to get the documents drafted before you leave here that day. We'll schedule an appointment for you to come back in. We'll sit down, we'll go over it all, make any changes that need to be made, and it's done. Get it all signed up and you're done. So in less time than most people usually spend planning a vacation. <laughs> and for less money than that vacation would cost, you can come in and see Lance, who is an expert in his field, been local here since he's been a little boy, take care of all of this. And the biggest benefit is to save the people who you want to have your assets hours and hours, maybe years of financial and legal stress and save them literally tens and tens of thousands of dollars. And then you can go on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> Once that piece is taken care of, then, now go on vacation. And then one extra thing is like a, for a special needs trust, mm -hmm. what would be the average price? We, so the types of special needs trusts that we do, um, and there are different types of mm -hmm. these trusts, the types of special needs trusts that we do are sort of like 
They're add-ons to the trust that you're already creating. Okay. And so we may charge uh, three to five hundred dollars to add a special needs trust okay. uh, for a beneficiary who would need something like that to your overall trust. Okay. So if that that's a relatively inexpensive addition uh, that provides a lot of impact and benefit for okay. individuals who uh, may be qualifying for yeah. public benefits at some point in their life. So people who are watching this, there's a lot of estate planning attorneys just look in Google um, and you're, they're kind of wondering why they should hire you. We obviously think there's a lot of reasons, but why when someone has a will, a trust, estate planning, why should they come in and make the call to talk with you? I think the big reason is that this is really all the work that I do. I, I focus my, uh, my practice uh, exclusively on wills and trusts and estates. So we are up to speed every day on what's going on in the law um, and with the courts and, and uh, you know, we kind of have our finger, finger on the pulse of uh, what's going on in this uh, area of law. We, we used to do, I used to do uh, several other types of law, but mostly as it related to estate planning like corporate uh, and business law. But over the last 10 or 15 years, I've focused my practice 100% exclusively on uh, wills, trusts, and estates, um, and that's all I do. Um, I try to do it in sort of a, a casual uh, format uh, atmosphere uh, where people can feel comfortable, and that's kind of what we're hoping to do is that when you come into this office, you're not nervous to meet with the lawyer, you're comfortable because uh, we're just uh, regular people, I'm just a regular person, uh, just like you. I try to uh, give people uh, an education about what it is that I do and what I think is appropriate for them. I like to give them the options that they're interested in. We talk about all, I, we together as the client and myself, uh, talk together about uh, their specific circumstances and I can make recommendations and in the end I want them to feel comfortable with what they've chosen to do if anything and if that's nothing I want them to feel comfortable saying thank you for uh, the education and and uh, we're gonna move on to somebody else and that's a hundred percent fine with us me that's a hundred percent fine with me Good. All right. Um, I want to just have to say one thing to the camera without. No, that's it's just it's just something you're not used to doing. Yeah. Um, so, do you have any more questions? I think we're getting to the yeah, end. Yeah. No, um, so I just want to do one more thing while we're rolling without us in the frame. Yeah. I want them just to talk to you so, for a second. So, yeah. one thing that I don't know how to ask the question. So, if uh, if you know that a loved one has a um, a terminal illness, mm -hmm. what's the suggestion? It really depends on the circumstances for that individual um, and the family. Uh, it depends on what the assets are uh, and it depends on uh, whether we have uh, sort of a warning of how long it's going to be before these plans need to be implemented, right? Before that person is actually going to uh, pass away. Uh, in some cases, if we've got some warning and we know it's going to be soon and the, and the circumstances are appropriate for it, we can do a lot of planning that's not very expensive through the beneficiary designations that we wouldn't normally do when, you know, the person may be alive for another 50 years and we don't know what's going to happen. But if we have kind of a heads up as to what's going to happen, depending on the assets, we can get things kind of squared away fairly inexpensively by using tools like the Ladybird deed and the beneficiary designations and things like that. Now, if it's a, um, a married couple with uh, a relatively large estate, well, there might be some things that we uh, need to do from an estate tax perspective, and that gives us some, uh, some ability to kind of, you know, if we can understand what we think is gonna happen in the near future, that can allow us to do some particular specific planning 
that we wouldn't otherwise be able to do if we have no idea which spouse is going to pass away first. And that all has to do with estate taxes and things like that, um, which really aren't a concern for most people these days. For a married couple, uh, the estate tax exemption amount uh, right now is approximately $27 million. So we're not worried about estate taxes unless we're talking about a very, very large estate. But if we're talking about something like that, knowing that uh, somebody is not long for this world uh, can present some planning opportunities that we wouldn't otherwise have. Okay. And those can be uh, more expensive, uh, you know, that's going to involve some trust planning and some moving of assets around and things like that. But, um, you know, so there's different options under different circumstances. Okay. I'm Lance Ragland. I am a local wills, trusts, and estates attorney. If you need help with any type of planning uh, to make sure that your assets are going to get to where you want them to go when you're gone, or if you've had a loved one who's passed away and you need probate administration or trust administration help, I want you to call me and let me help.